In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Dear faithful, on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost, I wish to speak to you yet again about some important practical details concerning vocations. And of course, we have the Holy Name men here today, and I reminded them in the meeting that they need to help me promote vocations. Fathers of families, men of the parish, men of good standing, gentlemen, should be promoting the religious and priestly vocations. That means a lot. It means a lot for the church when the men understand the importance of a vocation, when they understand the importance of promoting and supporting the religious and priests. So hopefully all the rest of us can also. So my points today in this sermon, the first two is first, what is necessary to preserve a religious vocation? And then, practically speaking, to talk a little bit about the oblates of the Society of St. Pius X, which is strictly a part of our order, which is dedicated to the religious vocation of a woman who maybe was already previously a religious in another foundation, but had to leave because it was modern or wrong, full of error. But even for those women who may not be able to enter another religious order because of age or maybe other circumstances, the Oblates allow them to come in at a later age in order to pursue this religious life. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. And as you know, in our parish here, we have Sister Anne Marie, who is one of our Oblates, and he, she's here attached to this parish in order to help the priests and to promote God in the religious life. So firstly, what is it that we need to do to preserve the religious, the religious soul, the vocation that is growing? So it makes it possible for a young man or woman to enter the religious life. And you'll see, dear faithful, this is really nothing extraordinary. It may seem like it today. You're almost a hero to do anything along what I'm going to say. But really, strictly speaking, it's just living up to our baptismal vows. The religious life is just a, a consecration of what God started in our religious life what we've been working on. We want to bring it to a new level. We want to solidify it, stabilize it. But really, you see, everything that I'm going to mention to you is everything that a Christian or Catholic should do. What are the necessary preservatives for chastity, then? Because strictly speaking, that's where a lot of souls can be led astray. A lot of vocations are lost for the lack of chastity. Yes, we talk about virginity very, very important to enter into marriage, the religious life. That's not the point of my sermon today, but it's worthwhile to, to pray and to understand why virginity is so important going into marriage and so important in going into a religious life. Is it absolute? No. Some religious orders would require it pretty strictly, but it's not an absolute, canonically speaking. But why is that? Why is chastity so important? And on top of that, virginity, preserving oneself, to give oneself to one's spouse. Again, you can study that. The only thing I will say today, because then you're not as though a short time or not, and that's not quite the word I mean, it's not, you're not being a mercenary. You've given your whole self to that other person and then back to you. There's something higher and more meaningful to that that you haven't sort of used up the gift already. And that's very important. The bond that is there between a couple, the bond that is there between the soul of a young man or woman with their Jesus, their spouse, is so important and so, so almost perfect because they haven't given themselves to anybody else. They preserve themselves for that one special person. And there's a bond there you can't, you can't deny, you can't doubt. So, for a religious person, let's just say, let's say a soul is pursuing a religious life, they need to preserve their chastity. And this can be reduced to seven ways. And again, this is just Christian Catholic living. Number one, to guard our senses. Two, to avoid idleness. Three, avoiding the occasions of sin. 
Four, promptness in repelling temptation. Five, care in avoiding sensual friendships. Six, temperance, and that would be temperance in everything that we do, all the way from the simplest things we do for ourselves, what kind of clothes we wear and the food that we eat, all the way up to maybe the use of money or the type of things that I show myself to be in society. So temperance. And then seven, openness of conscience, a real open conscience, which is what we see in little children. It's so admirable to us. A child knows another innocent person. Somehow, they, when they're attracted to another innocent soul. So what about this first preservative, guard over the senses? Guard over the senses and especially restraint of the eyes. For the Holy Ghost warns us that our senses are the windows of the soul by which death easily enters into a soul. Our eyes often get us in big trouble, a lot of trouble. It's so easy for our eyes to be so far beyond us. You know, it's one thing if we touch something or something comes to our mouth for taste. That's, that's a very immediate contact with me, but my eyes are the, it's the most spiritual of the senses. I can take an in information for a mile away if I can see that far. Yeah, it's very important to have a guard and restraint over the eyes. The Holy Ghost warns us that the senses and the eyes especially are the windows of the soul by which life or death enters. The second preservative, that of shunning self-indulgence and idleness, means not to be an idler or a dreamer. Let the enemy find you always busy, and temptations will be rare and powerless. Every man here, every woman here knows that idleness is the devil's playground. Devil's playground. Often when we're a little idle, we're thinking, what can I do with my time? What can I do? What's most immediate? I'll pull out the cell phone out of my pocket, and I'll touch the YouTube app. And then I'll spend three hours just scrolling. Three hours scrolling. Maybe nothing, nothing in particular, watching, just three hours gone. Then maybe some other things pop up there that offend our eyes, which we should have kept restrained over. Or maybe it's even a negligence of my prayer life or of other people that I should be taking care of. Or maybe it's in my work when I should be working and the employer expects of me a certain productivity, a certain effort, a certain time spent working, and yet I've cheated that employer because I'm, I'm now busy with my own entertainment. You see, at first value, it doesn't seem like it'd be too harmful, but it's against our chastity and it hurts our responsibility. Don't be a dreamer. Let the enemy always find you busy. The third preservative to chastity is avoiding occasions of sin. For according to the wise man, he that loves danger shall perish in it. For a religious person, it is a duty to fly contact with the world, except in cases of real necessity. And he there would be perhaps more exposed and more vulnerable than seculars, perhaps. For a strong, stronger reason, the religious should be faithful to precautions enjoined by his rule. So normally you know all of us have a rule that we follow. That's a protection, especially concerning relations with the persons of the other sex, our opposite gender. Avoid occasions of sin. For according to the wise man, he that loves danger shall perish by it. Our Lord says something similar with the he who lives by the sword shall perish by the sword. And, and I know it's a common problem for men, I would say more than women, to be just on the edge, just on the edge of intrigue and suspense, taking risks. Not a good idea. You know, we speak about guardrails in this life that keep us from going off into the abyss. You shouldn't be running your car along that guardrail. Not only will it look mangled, but you're liable to jump over at some point. Fourth preservative, promptness in suppressing temptation. We shake off a live coal as soon as we feel it. How many of you have touched something hot and the recoil is so fast you didn't know you could move that fast? 
That's not the case with sin, is it? We somehow think we can just kind of roll it around like a Rubik's Cube sin, play with it a little bit, entertain it a little bit. Meanwhile, we're burning ourselves. We're burning our souls. So promptness and suppression, temptation. We shake off a live coal as soon as we feel it. Otherwise, it burns and starts ablaze. And similarly, it's easier by far to get rid of a first impression than one which has already entered deep into the soul. That's a good examination of conscience for us today. Maybe I want to get rid of sin. I try to fight my temptations. But we already know that so many of those impressions have already been engaged in, and it's much harder to get rid of them than if I had said up front, nope, not for me. The first impression is easier to get rid of than something we started to live. It's become part of us. Enter deep into the soul. Another preservative, the fifth one, to preserve chastity in the preparation of a soul for a religious vocation would be to keep one's heart free from two human affections and to shun sensual friendships. For even those wherein one seeks no evil still commences by softening the soul and soon enkindles a concupiscence. It's the way we are made. It's the way we are. So, you know, when a young man or woman comes up to me or comes to the confessional and says, Father, is this type of activity which I'm having with my girlfriend or boyfriend wrong? We have to say yes if it's engendering anything that enters down that road of sensuality. That's why the hands-off approach until engagement is so important. Otherwise, you engage and you intensify the passions which have a purpose. I mean, it should not be going down that road. We've got to keep that distance. And so much more so for the human heart of a religious or priest. He avoids not because he thinks he might do evil, but he doesn't want to soften himself to the point where he could do evil. Softening in the soul and soon enkindling all kinds of concupiscence. The sixth preservative we can talk about, shun all intemperance. And of course, this takes many forms. It could be in drink, in food, in clothing, places we visit, things we do. Maybe we have a habit of saying it has to always be the best. It always, I cannot take anything less than the best. And I'm not saying because we don't want to do the best, because as gentlemen, you holy name men, but also any one of us in this parish, we want to do our best. We don't want to look like a slob, and we don't want to eat like a, like a slob. We should have some quality to what we do. But there's also a point where we don't have to always have the most expensive or the most of anything. Oh, I want ten of these when I could be fine with five. Avoid and shun all intemperance. And this is very important in a family to teach children this. The child says, I want another cookie, Dad. No, you had one. That's sufficient. But I want two. Nope. I want three pieces of cake. Nope. One is fine. But I want five beers, says your teenage son. Nope. One is fine. If you give your son teenage, teenage with beer. Oh, you laugh. I see you do. The seventh preservative, deserving of strongest recommendation because it assures the use of all the others. What's that mean? Is to have always the utmost candor of soul and the most perfect sincerity in dealing with our spiritual guides. Who is the first spiritual guide of any member of the family? The father. And everyone in that family, that's not always the case, but everyone in that family should have an openness with the father, an openness with the husband. The spouse. We shouldn't feel that we have to hide things from him or her. Now, men, since I'm talking in particular about your role, you have to be able to be approached. You have to have such an, a level of virtue in spiritual life that people feel like they can come to you as a spiritual guide. A lot of that falls upon us now, priests, because the men aren't there. The men aren't there to guide spiritually their families. It's not good, and I know a lot of you are working hard to be those spiritual guides. That's very good. But we should have a perfect sincerity in dealing with our spiritual guides. Who is that? Our confessor, the priest, our superior, our father, the husband. So that's good enough to point out to you today these five or seven preservatives that help us to keep the chastity of our souls in order that we may build up a vocation. Not only the person themselves who is pursuing the religious life, but also 
in our families, that we help our children so that there's nothing that would keep them back when God calls. And God may very well call because he sees the disposition of the person being prepared. I told you that the other point today would be to talk a little bit about the oblates of the Society of St. Pius X. And I will just tell you over the years now, 20 years of priesthood, I have worked in three retreat houses. Well, I worked in three retreat houses, but I've only been stationed at two of our three society retreat houses in the United States. And in doing so, I run across a lot of women who are very generous, who want to give themselves to God, give themselves to the religious life. And these women have been maybe 20 years already in their vocation as an office manager or secretary, maybe some other job. Maybe they were even in the military. I don't know. Maybe they were even in the religious life but left it because it was just so modern. And they say, what can I do, Father? What can I do to serve the Latin Mass and the Society of St. Pius X and tradition? And I have more than once told them, become an oblate. Become an oblate of the Society of St. Pius X. Unfortunately, because of our, our novitiates for the oblates are very rare, we now have a second one in the, in the world, but we had one for the longest time, Salvon, Switzerland, and we end up with a lot of Filipinos, Filipinas there. But part of the, may I say, obstacle was you had to learn French. And many of those women, you know, at 30, 40 years old, 50 years old, it's hard for them to learn another language. But if there's truly a vocation there, I would hope that would not hold them back. But it is something to consider. Now we have this other novitiate over in Asia. So a lot of our oblates go there now from the Asian countries. Of course, that would be English speaking. But that's what I found. Over the years, 20 years of priesthood, a lot of women, no obligations to a husband, maybe because they're a widow now or they were maybe never married. Maybe, as I said, they left the convent that was modern or no longer wanted them but they still want to serve the church and serve the Mass. Maybe they're a lady, as I mentioned, who's been many years in the world but says, that's a dead end, I want to dedicate my life at the end of my life now, or the next 40 years I want to give that to the church. Then there's the opportunity of the oblates. Now, as for a priestly revocation or any vocation, the woman needs to have the ability to enter into the oblates, of course. And one of the biggest obstacles that I find for any vocation, is debt. I think it's part of that mastermind of the devil. He puts us all under debt, and then we're not free. We're not free when he calls, when God calls us, because the devil has us in chains over there with a good old buck. So easy, isn't it, with credit cards and other things? We rack up a lot of debt, and then we're forever and holding, beholden. We become the religious of the banks. Yeah, we serve the bank because of debt. That's not proper. So I encourage any woman who's really interested in the oblates to get rid of her debt. And if any one of us could help such a willing soul who wants to go to the religious life to get rid of their debt, let us do it. Let's help them pay it off so they can go and not be shackled by the devil of money. Another obstacle that can be there for an oblate is family. She's not ready to let go because her, her son, her daughter, her grandchildren need her. If there's a real need, that's one thing. That might be a sign there's no vocation. If they're depended on. But that has to be really discerned, whether that's truly just family making good use of grandma or mom, and whether there's a vocation there, that she should not be prohibited. She should not be stuck doing things that people just take advantage of anyway. So what would an oblate be doing? She would practice a devotion to Holy Virgin Mary under the title of Our Lady of Sorrows. She would recite her rosary every day, and even 15 decades if she could. She would adorn her room with pictures of Mary and the images of the saints. She would practice humility and simplicity avoiding rash judgments, slanders, and reflections contrary to charity. All the virtues that she practices, she would remember to keep discreet and reserve in dealings with neighbor. 
She has to deal a lot with priests and religious, other religious, and even faithful. She will make certain to be very discreet in the practice of the religious. And she'll have great patience in helping to endure the difficulties and trials of community life. It's not easy for a woman at 30, 40, 50 years old to enter religious life after she's been in the world because she's had so much independence. She has to be able to bend her will to the rule of the community, to the lawful superiors above her. An oblate would have to get up like at 6 a.m. in the morning. No sleeping in, ladies. It's time to pray. And go to your office, same divine office, and then go to Mass, make your meditation. Do your work, and then go to lunch and evening or middle, mid, midday prayer. And you always have time for recreation and more work. And what's the work of an oblate? Many tasks, because it depends on the priory where she's assigned. She could be teaching in the school, she could teach catechism, she could sew vestments and work in the sacristy. She may even have to do other tasks like secretarial tasks. I know there's a lot of women out there who could do this, who would find a better end to their last few years of their life. But again, they have to be called to that. And what's a sign of that? They're ready to go. They don't have any debt. They have a good mind, a good will. They like to pray. They're willing to pray or to learn. And they don't have anybody relying on them. They're free to go. Not married, as I said. Think about it, ladies of the parish. Spread the word. We need more oblates in the Society of St. Pius X. This is very few, comparatively, to the priests. And it's just a, a necessary, I would say, end to our baptismal promises. If we have no other obligation and we want to serve God in the church, a good end to our baptismal promises. And then we, on our part, and our families, dear men of Holy Name Society, and all of you out there, will preserve this chastity by the seven preservatives I mentioned today in order that the vocation may flower. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.